Yeah, Montgomery. What's up with me was uh, segregated water fountains, segregated bathrooms, segregated school, segregated buses. I saw a burning cross one time. There was lynchings in the newspaper. It was palpable and tense. Was there any fear? Sure there was. There was lots of fear. There was tears, too. I mean, what do you do when you go to the bathroom in public? You go in the back bath- black bathroom? You go in the white bathroom? I was afraid of getting beat up. I didn't know what side to choose. Which side did you choose? I didn't. I went home. What do you do? You're just a little 13-year-old kid. It starts with just taking that leap. Man, you have to work hard. You have to be incredibly smart. Choose something that even if it fails, even if it fails you are going to be proud of it. doesn't matter how badly you got beat in that. Be kind, be kind, be kind. Become a better person, a better leader, a better business. Go with your gut. <laughs> I'm Samuel Donner. And this is Finding Founders. We'll get back to the podcast right after this break. Today's sales leaders know that expectations are at an all-time high. I'm talking higher than Mount Everest. Climb to the top, you might get cold. Sales folks are expected to leverage a slew of different tech. We're talking AI. But there's a better way to win. It all starts with a new HubSpot sales hub. HubSpot Sales Hub unifies your data, tools, and team inside a smart and powerful platform. There's a new prospecting workplace, deal management tools, and AI-powered tools to help reps optimize based on real-time results. And bonus, bonus alert, reps can automate their busy work so they can focus on doing what they do best. That's closing deals. It's smart software for smart sales teams that feels good to use. With Sales Hub, closing deals is no big deal. Try it for yourself at HubSpot.com slash sales. Again, that's HubSpot.com slash sales. And now, back to the podcast. Linda has experienced a lot. She's traveled the world as an army brat, played piano and sung in Led Zeppelin's tour bus, explored drugs as an X-rated hippie, and worked to understand her Latin American Chicano and indigenous roots through her art. Through her various paintings, sculpture, and ceramic work, Linda embraces her brownness, and the world has taken notice. Her work has been shown globally in major galleries and museums, as well as Chicano and Latino spaces. Today, her artwork focuses on encouraging discussions surrounding how class, culture, and the color of her skin intersect, notably in her Make Em All Mexican pieces. But let's look at where this all started and dive into Linda's roots. Let's look back to where her family story began with her grandparents meeting while working on the railroads. My grandfather worked on the railroad. Both of my grandmothers were uh, maids on the railroad. They actually met each other there, and that's how my parents met each other as well. I'm Mexican-American. My mother was born in Concord, California. My dad was born in San Antonio, Texas. Both of my grandmothers were born in El Paso, and both of my grandfathers were born in Mexico. I mean, this is at the late 19th century. And up until about, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, I must have had maybe 500 relatives in Southern California. Oh, my goodness. Huge family. It's a giant family. But I mean, you know, I was born in Boyle Heights. You're what the original Mexican-American community of Los Angeles. You know, they come from, you know, working class roots. Really beautiful family. What are some of your earliest memories like growing up like as a kid? East L.A. You know, I was in East L.A. till I was three years old. I was the oldest granddaughter on both sides of my family. So I was everybody's baby doll, everybody's princess. You know, I was wonderful, surrounded by love. You know how old fashioned families were with the gatherings and everything in the old times when everybody got together. You know, everyone was together in one place at one time with tons of food and thousands of kids and the guys playing poker and the women in the kitchen. I mean, this is this goes across lots of cultures, races, creeds, colors. It's the American way. But since your dad was in the Air Force, you moved pretty early on to Germany. So that's right. How is that move? Oh, you know, I started moving at three and never stopped really until I was like 25 years old. I mean, odd to go from Southern California to Germany. I mean, that was really... Big move, big move. Well, you know, after being surrounded by so much family and then being alone in Germany wasn't that great psychologically for a little kid. It was beautiful, but it was lonely. It was lonely. And that's where I found myself as a individual who made objects because my paintings were, gener- were you know, they were my invisible friend. It's what I did. For myself, when I was alone, and I was alone a lot. 
I think that to accept yourself as an artist means to accept yourself in alone time constantly. That's what it means to be a writer. That's what it means to be a painter. What was like the first kind of stuff you made when you were a kid in Germany? Like how did you express yourself initially? You know, I don't have too many memories about specific objects. I do have one of a, when I came, finally came back to LA, I have an image of a, an Easter egg on a big piece of paper with finger paints and the smell of the paint and being on my knees and just really loving the smearing and the colors. And I remember lifting up my hands and seeing the paint all over my hands and really thinking that was just really romantic and wonderful. And didn't I just love this shit? Wasn't it just great? And oddly enough, I do have a memory when I was in elementary school of painting trees. And I came back to that many decades later and painted many trees. Yeah, I see a bunch of trees yeah, around us right now. Yeah, a lot right of now. trees around, which is an interesting correlation in terms of growing, you know, when you, as a lot of screenwriters, as a lot of poets, as a lot of, you know, fiction writers, as a lot of painters, they return to their own memories and to their own childhood and their up their own upbringing. The uh, inspirations that they had as a small child, as a young adult, oftentimes find themselves integrated into something else. And I thought, you know, I can really understand what it means to draw from your own experiences to build a lifetime of work because it comes naturally. That's what you do. How did your parents like encourage that artistic endeavors? I was lucky to be a girl because, you know, most parents say don't do that. And, And they're absolutely right. Don't do that. Why would you say absolutely right? Well, it's a hard life. You suffer a lot. There's really no uh, security. They tell you this. This is what they tell you. And it all sounds kind of campy and stupid, but there really is no security. I know a lot of artists aren't married. A lot of artists I know do not have children. They do their divorce with maybe one child. They don't own homes. They don't have decent cars. They don't have health insurance. They don't have dental insurance. I mean, they really suffer for their image, suffer for their ideas, suffer for what they offer. It's a lot of work and not a lot of return in terms of what most people consider success. Most people consider success to be, you know, objects, big vacations, expensive dinners, expensive clothes, all that stuff. And artists don't get that. In most cases, they just don't. What is it? 2% of the world's artists make their livelihood from selling their paintings. Wow. The data is not good. So I was very lucky to be a girl because then it was kind of like, oh, she'll get married. <laughs> she'll have some guy to take care of. Her, so think, all right, right. Yeah. What was the move back to the U.S. like after Germany? I lived in several states all over the nation, lived like two years here, two years there, two years here, two years there. You know, it was tough. I don't have a lot of memories of friends and stuff. I I have memories of moving a lot. Do you remember like first grade kindergarten or yeah. something we talked uh, about, whereas like your teacher would read literature and you would draw about it. It seems like your teachers were seeing an early talent and maybe supporting it. Absolutely. I won a lot of awards as a little kid. Uh, Mrs. Johnson, First Street School in East L.A. when we finally made it back, she would have us read children's books. And then she had easels set up in the back of the room and we were asked to illustrate the books that we read. I was pretty savvy. I would walk around the room and see what everybody else was painting. And then I go, oh, that's a good thing to include. There's some inspiration. There's some stuff. Oh, yes, I could include that in my painting. And then I'd go do mine, taking from ideas that I saw around the room, which is really what you do when you look at art anyway. You're supposed to look at many things and then devise the image that you're going to create. I think it's also it's like easier to follow that when you're a kid. Uh, I think a lot of people see sparks of like creativity in childhood and then like the world kind of steers them away from that something that's interesting is like you have this this early talent that you've kept refining and kept with you i i kind of want to take that to montgomery because you say this is like the first time you were in like the black world and after all this travel i ended up going to montgomery alabama with my parents my dad it was uh a really difficult place. I was like 13 years old. It's when, you know, a young adult finds themselves. You're just beginning to find your personality, just beginning to find out who you are. Who do you think you were becoming then? I had no idea. Who knows mm-hmm. at 13? <laughs> yeah. Who knows at 13? I mean, I knew I was a painter. Mm. I knew when I was an artist because that's what I did. I was writing poetry. I mean, I already knew that this was it for me. I was the only Mexican within 100, God bless it, miles, man. Maybe 500 at that point. Maybe a thousand. That's like, it's rough because you had this beautiful family upbringing with extended, extended family, Mm -hmm. communally Mm -hmm. gathering all the time. And then to be isolated in Germany and then isolated in Montgomery, Alabama. Did you feel yourself like yearning 
to express or experience like your Mexicanness, or was that even not not even on your radar? You know, it's kind of like uh, when you're growing up. This is the first time I realized that I was a person of color. Really, in in Montgomery, Montgomery. Alabama. Before then, I was just a human being, and I didn't notice the color of my family. They were just my family, and I loved them. I didn't notice that they were working class. I didn't notice that we lived in a working class neighborhood. I didn't notice any of these things. I just, I was a kid who loved her family and everybody was good to me and I loved everybody. It wasn't until I moved to Montgomery that I realized that when I went to Europe, nobody seemed to notice. And I, in Europe, I belonged very easily. So like Germany was easier, but somehow like your home country of America was Yeah, not. Montgomery was tough. I mean, it was uh, segregated water fountains, segregated bathrooms, segregated school segregated buses. I mean, we were there during the Selma marches. This is mid sixties. I saw a burning cross one time. There was lynchings in the newspaper. It was palpable and tense. Was there any fear? Sure. There was, there was lots of fear. There was tears too. I mean, what do you do when you go to the bathroom in public? You go in the back bath, black bathroom, you go in the white bathroom. I was afraid of getting beat up. I didn't know what side to choose. What side did you choose? I didn't. I went home. What do you do? You're just a little 13 year old kid. You know, in Montgomery, Sydney Lanier High School, there was a hundred black students mixed in with something like 2000 white kids. Wow. High schools were integrated for the first time when I was there. The water fountains were being integrated. Everything was changing. Are there any specific moments where you were hurt because of all of this, like kind of like evil that was going on? You can't, you can't experience something like that and not be damaged. You can't. It's impossible to be 13 years old and see race hatred, to experience prejudice and race hatred. It's going to affect you. It's going to scar you for life. You can't get out of it. I think it's the bedrock of my newest works, all the brown works that I've been doing for the last 12 years. But it's taken an entire lifetime to be able to consolidate the feelings of that time into an image combined with my own experiences coming back to L.A. and finding my own brownness, finding my own mexicanismo, my own chicanismo, my own indigenismo, which are words that are they're like Vallejo. If you can't say it, you know, you say Native American, you say Mexican American, but it's all the same. You have to find out who you are and you're given this deck of cards. And so I can't I can't walk away. I can't whitewash it. There's nothing I can do to it. It's what it is. And I kind of woke up. There was tears. There was fear and there was an awakening that took place in me at that time, which I'm very grateful for. And it's still alive. You know, when you see racial hatred still alive, you kind of go, wow, the big experiment, maybe it's not working so good. Maybe it's not working that well that we can't get along. Why can't we just get along? Right. You know, the old the phrase, it's, it's very interesting polemic that we live in. We have this ideal of all, you know, multiracial communities, but I don't know. I don't know. I still don't believe it's totally possible in the United States. Not from what I've been able to see. It was really rough. And then from there, I took a hop skip to Spain, which was like, boom, total, total shift. Yeah. So was that again, like another just bam? Yeah, bam. You get on a plane and bam, you're living someplace else. Were you happy? Oh, yeah. I love Spain. I love Europe. Oh, God. Do you remember getting on the plane or do you remember your dad saying, hey, family's moving? Like, do you remember that moment? Sure, I do. My dad said, you want to stay at home and do homeschooling or you want to go to a boarding school? I said, I'm out of here. I want to go to boarding school. And I left. Boarding school in Spain? Yeah. Wow. It was hot. It was great. I was 15 years old. It was like being in college. And I gave up Christianity and I never went back. Can you describe like landing in Spain? Uh, You know, it was like a breath of fresh air to go to Europe all of a sudden. It was a beautiful land. You know, Spain smells like olive oil. It's, you know, it's got food in the air and spices in the air. And there's so much beautiful architecture and there's so much art everywhere. And there's just this fabulous food and wine. And, oh, God, it's like heaven compared to Montgomery. Yeah. And also, I mean, I'm assuming you spoke Spanish. No, I didn't. Really? I learned Spanish in Spain because my parents, when they were in elementary school in Los Angeles, they were punished for speaking Spanish, literally. Right. Corporal punishment. And now it's like we're coming back to this place where culturally unique people are celebrated. But before it was like, push that down. So you learned Spanish in Spain. Was that difficult? No, I would just talk to people and ask them, como se dice? How do you say that? Como se dice? Como se dice? One of the things that happens for army brats, air force brats, is that you either make it or you don't. 
you either learn how to be really flexible with your surroundings or you really shrink back because the change has become too much for you. And I really just took it on and just enjoyed every moment of the changes. I am a curmudgeon, but overall, I am optimistic about things, about life, about possibilities. And this was just a new possibility and there was so much there. My God. God, I had so much freedom all of a sudden. I relinquished the Catholic Church. Yeah, so you were in the Catholic Church in Spain. And how did you make that decision to relinquish that? I went to church one day and the priest said, thank God that you're a Christian, a Catholic, because you're of the few that'll make it into heaven. And I just said, you know what? I can't take this. I'm not willing to be a part of a religion that's going to say I'm worth more because I believe in a certain God. I never went back and I still have the same beliefs. I'm not a Christian today. What kind of beliefs did you develop? Indigenous, Native American, traditional beliefs. You know, nature is is really are my gods. You know, the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets. What makes me the happiest is looking at the Hubble photographs. Beautiful. So, Spain, you have all this freedom. What do you decide to do with it? Paint, design clothes, write music, perform, write poetry, go places, travel, learn the language, travel alone, go to Portugal, go to Italy, go to England. Oh, man, yeah. Let's go. Do you remember any of those early travels in Spain? Like any of the stories? I'd love to hear some like specific adventures that you went on. Oh, I went to uh, Portugal and met a really wonderful girl on the airplane who invited me to her family's house. And just like that, that's what would happen. I would go places and I would meet people and I would be invited to stay at people's homes and to have fabulous meals and to take drives around places and see landscapes I've never seen before. I had an opportunity to travel all over Spain with my parents and see many of the castles and many of the great architectural pieces, the prehistoric caves and the Roman walkways and all the major museums of Europe. I saw bodies of work by the great European artists when I was in my teens. feels like there was like so much inspiration around you. Like there was just like you were grabbing from all these different cultures and just absorbing so much. Well, you know, when you're 15, you're a sponge. If you're open and you really want to experience life, you should be a sponge forever. I think you can be a sponge forever. Yeah. Well, it's kind of like what you said earlier, though, that some people have creative inspiration when they're little, when they're young children. And then somehow they close off their heart. They close off their mind. They close off their imagination. Yeah. You mentioned that you were not seen as Mexican or as a different race in Spain, that racial divide that you felt in Montgomery wasn't as much there in Spain. Did you feel like an outsider still? No, I felt more at home in Spain than I've ever felt in my life, really. I've never felt that way again. I was really in a community of artists and it was a different way of experiencing being an artist. Unfortunately, in the United States, no matter where you are, artists are considered outsiders. When you think about it, if you just think about it for a minute, artists are considered to be weirdos, strange, incomprehensible, freeloaders. You know, they're just wasting their time unless they make a great deal of money. Yeah, I feel like money validates artistry in terms of like the the people who are not artists. Right. Then even then, if you have really famous, well-known artists, a lot of people don't understand them. They're considered esoteric, like they're not understood and nobody really wants to understand them. What are they talking about? Really complex works of art aren't understood by most people because you have to research, you have to study, you have to interpret, you have to investigate. And Americans really aren't up to it. A very small percentage are a very, very small percentage. And they tend to be the most highly educated or the most cultured, which doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be highly educated, but cultured. I think like the more uh, expansive your experience, the more that you understand like these artists that are expanding and experiencing as much as they can and broadening their horizons. Well, Europeans think more like that than Americans do. They're surrounded by art. They're surrounded by architecture. They're surrounded by great works of art and history and stuff. Europe was incredibly beautiful, incredibly wonderful, incredibly inspiring. When did you leave? Well, I left in 1969 and went back in 1974. I came back for grad school. So in 1969, what did it feel like to leave Spain? And what was like the moment that you realized you would have to leave? When my dad, you know, got moved back to the United States. How old are you when your dad gets moved back to the U.S.? 17. So this is like teetering on the edge of, you know, you probably could make some of your own decisions or was that not true at that point? Like, did any part of you want to stay? Yes. And I wish I had. Was there any internal like monologue or like, do you remember like... I remember crying very deeply. 
when your dad said, Hey, no, when I got on the plane and they said I couldn't have a beer, I was like, Oh man, I'm leaving Europe. All my freedom seemed to be taken away from me. And also your memories of the U S are not rosy or the opposite. Yeah, it's kind of rough, but I was coming back to LA where I was going to be with family and stuff, which was a little better. Did you even know it was going to be good? No, I didn't know it was going to be good. I just knew I wasn't going to have the kind of freedom in the United States I was going to have in Europe. I already knew that I wasn't going to find the same kind of respect as an artist that I had in Europe. What was the respect you had as an artist? What was your community like? Were you like painting? Were you like creating sculptures? What were you doing? Oh, I was a painting. I was in high school, remember? I was designing my own clothes. I was having my own clothes made. I was producing artwork. I was writing a lot of music. I was performing all the time. I did all the artwork for my high school annual. I was voted most talented in my high school. Wow. I was producing constantly. I'm loving every minute of it. Was there any like either performance that you did or thing that you produced during that time in Spain that was particularly interesting or important or meaningful to you? Any like story behind some of the work that you did there that like maybe embodied what you were exploring about yourself? Well, when you design your own look, what you look like, the clothes that you wear, rather than buying them at a store, creating your own persona is a major step for anybody at any age, much less what a 15 year old. How did you do that? I drew pictures of the clothing and then I would show them to a seamstress and we'd have fittings. I designed my own dress for the prom. Wow. Yeah. I mean, when you're doing this, I mean, this is not something that a 15 year old does. I mean, how many people design their own clothes they wear, design their own shoes? This is a sign of real creativity when you get to be the persona that you build. What did people think of how you dressed? I was devoted most talented in my school. I was, you know, know, intellectually twisted when I was 15 years old. Really, I was edgy at 15. I mean, that's a great feeling to have that kind of a freedom of yourself. You know, most kids at 15 are kind of goofy. I was the same then as I've been all my life. When I came back to L.A., I became a hippie and basically just blew the roof off of everything. How did you become a hippie? Well, I don't know. I just took a dive into it. I was in the art department and I was in the theater department. I did eight major productions in college. I mean, you know, to have the spirit of an artist throughout your life is a really beautiful and a wonderful thing to do. And I couldn't be happier with it. To give up a lot of constraints, especially Christian religious constraints, is a great thing to do as a young person. How did you start to erode those when you came back to like Whittier? Because you were back in L.A., you were in college, you had like created your own style in Spain, but... It feels like when you came back to L.A. now, it was like an expansion of all these things that you've been exploring. Well, you know, it was, was, you know, it was mind exploring drugs. You know, everybody was doing drugs. What was the first like mind exploring drug that you tried and where were you? Well, didn't everybody just do marijuana? Everybody did a lot of marijuana. It was totally illegal. You know, everybody was uh, trying to discover something else. The Vietnam War was up. My dad was in the war. And there's all kinds of picketing and demonstrations going on. There was a lot of rock and roll in the air. You know, the stones that were everywhere and Led Zeppelin was there. I mean, it was just, it was roaring and it was rocking. It was hot and it was heated and it was, you know, half naked. You know, everybody was just out of their minds. I never went to class and I still graduated with like a 3.3 or something. Wow. Spent my whole life in the art department. Uh, One time I left a burning joint in my dorm room and burnt the place down and nobody called me out on it. You burnt the place down? Well, my room. I burnt my room down. My God. I came home and found my furniture on the sidewalk all burnt up. My girlfriend came over and I don't know what happened. And nobody called me out on it because I was really famous on campus. Everybody knew who I was. I was performing every weekend in the spot. I was writing music. I was performing constantly in the theater. I had keys to the art department because they just said, I'll leave Linda alone. She's busy. She's working. I just was a really dedicated artist. And my craziness just seemed to match uh, who I was in terms of discovering myself as a creative person. Did you get positive feedback for the work that you were creating? Like, did anyone ever tell you like, wow, you're doing something special here? I did, but mostly in the music and theater area. I performed in a few theater pieces I was very, very proud of. I had no difficulty in letting myself completely go and really feel deeply into roles. I really wanted to be an actress. Were there themes that you were exploring? Like what emotions were you exploring? Depth of emotion, capacity to reach emotion, capacity to express emotion. 
every emotion. You have to dig a well that's very deep and then you have to fill it. When you were digging deep into those roles, were there things that were difficult to confront? Sexuality. Sexuality uh, in public, in front of a bunch of people, is a very difficult thing to do. It's vulnerable. You're extremely vulnerable. You're sharing internal aspects of yourself that are oftentimes kept very private. Being a painter is different. You can paint it and walk away. But people see you and you have to find it in yourself. What forms were you expressing your sexuality? Like, was there a moment where you're like, oh, this is actually like difficult? Well, imagine having to feel a sexual desire for someone that you don't even know. How do you do that? How do you, okay, let's do a scene where I'm your age and you're madly in love with me. I mean, how do you do that? It's very difficult to do. You have to project your feelings of desire onto something, onto a glass. You have to project your needs, your sexual needs, your desires, your fantasies onto something else. You have to find it somewhere else. And you kind of like look at them, but you're not really looking at them. You're thinking of something else. You're dreaming of something else. You're remembering another experience that you might have had. And so you're revealing yourself to an entire audience. Was there something that you, you feel like that was complicated about your sexuality that you were exploring? No, I was just uh, young and shy. I mean, what, what could I possibly know at 17? I mean, what do you know about your sexuality at 17? I think what all this is leading to is that I was in very sophisticated ground at very young age. I got to experience very dense and difficult topics, including what? Freedom. I had a lot of physical and emotional spiritual and psychological freedom as a very young person. You asked me if my parents supported me, they let me loose and trust me. World. Yeah. And I made it become the person that I wanted to become. I mean, I, I've been true to myself. I'm, I was true to my decision about religion. I was true to myself and my decisions about intimate relationships. I've been true to myself as a painter, as difficult as it's been. What were some of the things that you experienced that were uncomfortable? Strange the psychedelic visions where things are moving and plants are breathing and walls are breathing and it really places you into mind bending what they call mind bending experiences which can be very uncomfortable if you're not ready for that if you're not savvy about what the drug can do to your head what do you think it can do i'm not so sure to be honest with you mm. I can't drink alcohol or do any drugs when I paint anymore. I haven't been able to do that in decades. I have to be totally clear to be able to think of an image. I definitely don't need or need any drugs or want any drugs to become creative. That's what I found out from it. Mm. I think it was more like a community building tool where everybody used drugs together. Right? I was lucky that nothing terrible happened to me. And I'm telling you, there was a few times when I think maybe something could have happened to me. I'm grateful that I made it in and got to experience and got it out. Being a hippie wasn't that easy, not for women, especially. I mean, I looked down, uh, I wanted to be a vocalist so bad. I was rehearsing all constantly. And I was a woman of color. There was hardly any chance for me down that road. I tried, I had interviews with big producers. Can you tell me about one of those experiences, like walking into a a bus, a giant bus in Beverly Hills and playing a piano on a giant tour bus. I didn't do too bad, but it was just a big world and it was pretty scary. Led, it was Led Zeppelin's bus. So you played piano in Led Zeppelin's bus? Yeah. And their, their producer was there and listened to me and I, had, I was up for uh, doing background work. I did a gig at the uh, Troubadour. Wow. Can we rewind a little bit? How did you get onto Led Zeppelin's bus? I had a girlfriend in one of my paint classes who was married to a really rich guy. And he happened to know the people, all these people, all these producers, all these rock and roll producers. And she said to me one day, hey, Linda, I know you want to be a vocalist. And so here's, here's a couple of numbers you can call. Just call them up. They're ready for you. All you got to do is go out and sing. And so I picked up my shit and went out. So you started calling people? Yeah. And this I'm like, what, 18, 19? And, and got into auditions and did auditions and the whole so thing. Tell me about one of those phone calls. Hi, this is Linda Vallejo. And I was told by Mary X to give you a call. She said I could come out and maybe sing a couple songs for Oscar. Yeah, sure. Why don't you come on down? And so you got onto the bus? Yeah, I, got, I drove up with my friends and we, they said, here, come on in here. There's a piano in here. You can play this one. What did it look like inside? Remember a lot of everything was like upholstered in red. It was what you would expect out of that age and that time and the movie stars and the the, you know, the rock and roll stars and what was happening out there. Were you nervous? 
sure. I was nervous, but I think my friends told me I played better than I ever played. And then you finished up and then what? I finished up and nothing ever happened out of it. Did he say like, I'll give you a call or? Yeah, we'll follow up with you. Maybe be back in October or something and do something. And then nothing? No, nothing. Uh, I could have pressed it harder. I was invited to do a, a performance in the Fantastics, the Fantastics. People wanted me to do Broadway, but it was just, it wasn't private enough. That whole world just wasn't private enough for me, boy. There was a selling point about it that I didn't like. You know, being a painter is very private. You can do whatever you want. No one tells you what to do. You don't need a band. You don't need a producer. You don't need a venue. You don't need fans. You don't need anybody or anything. All you need is a pad of paper. That's all you need. Being a writer is even is just as good. You don't need anybody. And that's where I wanted to be. Didn't want to owe my soul to the company store. And I certainly didn't want to owe my soul to some misogynistic male. And boy, could I see a lot of shit down that road. It scared me. It was frightening. We'll get back to the podcast right after this break. I Digress, hosted by Troy Sandage, is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. With shows under 30 minutes, I Digress helps eliminate complexity, complications, and confusion in your business with frameworks and strategies to achieve scalable and sustainable success. Uh, in episode 91, he talks about how to eliminate false perceptions and what the worst case scenario is in pitching your business. The worst case is just them saying no. And many people stop pitching their business or start continuing their business just because they might hear no, and they shouldn't. He dives more into it in that episode, but definitely check it out. Listen to I Digress wherever you get your podcasts. And now back to the podcast. So how did you decide to like, pivot out of vocalist gigs to something else. If I had another life to live, I'd go into acting. I'd go into be a vocalist again. I'd be a songwriter. You just don't get that many lives. You just can't do it all at once. I looked for my best bet and my best bet was a longevity. As an actor, you only have a certain amount of longevity unless you have a great career and a great deal of backing. But as a painter, you can paint your whole life. Nothing has to, there won't be anything to stop you. You could be creative all your life and you don't need anybody to do it. And you could be married and have children and have a home and have a loving environment for your life. Not so lonely and uh, be able to paint. So I said, okay, I'm going to dedicate myself to this. So how did you really move towards being like an artist? You build a, you build a portfolio of work and then you apply for graduate school. And what was that portfolio of work that you were? I was in Spain again. I went back to Spain and created a portfolio of work there. What was it like being back in Spain? It's a really different world, you know, than there. It's hard to explain the difference. So why leave? Was it just you missing Europe or was there something that was pushing you away from LA? No, I had already met my future husband and I was deeply in love. And How did you meet? Uh, we met at the LA airport as two students going home to Washington, D.C., he was carrying a box of organic vegetables that he got on board with. And he says, I changed my ticket. I say he changed his ticket, but we ended up on the same plane sitting side by side. And we've been together ever since. Really nice guy. What was he doing? He was going to Washington, D.C. His father was working at the Pentagon. So was mine. We had nobody. I didn't know anybody in D.C. He didn't know anybody in D.C. So we dated over Christmas and I came home with him for uh, New Year's and, you know, we we were friends and lovers ever since then. How did you like start to build a life together? Slowly. We didn't marry for five years. I went back to Europe. He was in Santa Cruz. I was finishing up at Whittier College. He would drive back and forth from uh, Santa Cruz to see me. I would drive up to Santa Cruz to see him. We did this long distance relationship for a long time. Was that difficult? No, no, it wasn't difficult. It's fun. We just sent tapes to each other. We couldn't text each other, but we wrote letters. It was very romantic. It was very nice. It was before social media and all that stuff. And then I went to graduate school and we moved in together and got married. What was the, uh, the portfolios that you were creating? European imagery, lots of European architecture, because I was seeing a lot of it, influenced by it, searching for a new spirituality for myself, trying to find something new that I could believe in that was beyond money beyond possession, something that could carry me into the afterlife somehow or another. 
begging for some kind of answer. And so just, you know, searching, searching for something and drawing images about the search. Oddly enough, you know, there's so much Christian art in Spain that, you know, I ended up doing lots of Christian stuff. The portfolio I did at that point was called A Complex Man. And uh, they were psychological portraits that kind of look almost digitized if you look at them today. Sort of abstracted heads. Uh, I did many of them and I really enjoyed them. It was like the, a complex man was really about the complexity of your mind, the complexity of your uh, interpretation of your life, of your interpretation of life itself. The psychological man, right? The psychological being. And that's really what I wanted to, that's what I was searching for, was to understand myself so that I could see what my image was and what my purpose was and why I was here. On the other side of that, did you... Was that more clear, your image and your purpose? Well, you know, you, you, when you make an image, you, you know when, when it fulfills its task. You look at it and you go, yeah, that's what I was thinking. They're like mirrors in a way. And you look at them and then you realize things that are inside of you that you didn't know. You realize things that you did know that, were, that you presented in a different way than you imagined. You know how creativity is. It moves. It's not static. It, it's a living thing. It's a living entity that, that's inside of you, right? That was like a, a way to kind of see the complexity inside your own, own head. But when did you start moving towards like representing and trying to understand indigenous traditions? Because that seems to be when you were maybe structuring and anchoring your spirituality and something again. Well, you know, um, before I tell you that story, I'll tell you that I moved into it and I moved out of it and I've moved back into it and not so much in terms of giving it up, but just involvement. I uh, spent 30 years studying indigenous traditions in Mexico and the United States. I joined a dance troupe called Flores de Aslan in Los Angeles. I was working at Self Help Graphics at the time. I came back to LA, went to graduate school and found out about a job. And someone said, oh, there's a job in this nonprofit organization up in Los Angeles. They're looking for artists. And I was like, oh, so here I am, independent me. I was doing factory work. I was modeling for art classes, and I was waiting on tables to make it through grad school. And I said, oh, an art job. I could use one of those. Let's do that. And I went up to Self-Help Graphics and met Sister Karen Bocaletto. Self-Help Graphics is still alive today and thriving under the fabulous leadership of Betty Avila, who's just retired her position, her tenure at that organization. Fabulous individual. And uh, there's been many leadership people there since then. And uh, I was making art in the Chicano art movement, which was a, a really weird switch for me because here I am doing European stuff, speaking Spanish. Most Chicanos don't speak Spanish. You know, I have, a, you know, this whole, I'm doing, you know, art that's tethered in the European traditions. Versus uh, muralism, uh, street art, uh, self-taught artists grounded in uh, cultural identity, which I had I didn't know about, right. and yet I looked the part, and I was born the part. We had no idea about this, like these cultural undertones in the art world. Nothing. It's like I'm because you know I was thrown out of East LA at three into Germany. Boom, I was thrown out of Germany, and boom, boom, boom. We didn't really have a chance to explore it, really. No. I didn't get in there. Nobody took, nobody took me there. So what was it like being there? Oh, it was really strange at first. I tried, I, you know, I did my best. I worked, I worked at Self Up Graphics uh, as a part of the California Arts Council Artists in Residence for three years and taught little kids how to do silk screen because I was in the graduate department of printmaking and I spoke Spanish so I could speak to all the little kids hmm. and I have no sense of uh, caliber of character, ability to communicate, a desire to make a contribution to the world is more important to me than someone's class or color or creed, you know, the value of an individual life, you know, uh, but I didn't belong. <laughs> I did not belong. And there was nothing I could do about it. Just, just because you hadn't lived. Well, I was like, I was at, you know, I was like, more like a white girl. I thought I was, a, I thought I was an ugly white girl till I was 25 years old. It took a long time to get some footing in that world, even though it's mine. Mm. Yeah, it's totally different. And the way of life is completely different. The language is different. The lifestyle is different. Did you ever get like flack? Oh, hell yes. Do you remember any, uh, any moments? So like, what, like when you were first entering that community, like what, what were some of the things people would say to you? What were like some of the experiences you encountered? 
just dismissed, hmm. not not included, dismissed, misunderstood. It was it was tough. What was an example of you being dismissed? Like, do you remember any specific moment? Just not being included in certain cultural opportunities or artistic opportunities. Whereas in college, I was invited to do everything. In graduate school, I was uh, leave Linda alone. She's gonna do her job. Trust me. In the Chicano world, you had to kind of prove yourself. It was a long hard run. I was married to a white guy. I spoke Spanish. I just came back from Europe. I was in the MFA program, surrounded by self taught artists. You can imagine. Imagine. It, was a, it was a real shift. I talked mm. different than everybody. I was the right color. Uh, what is this? 50 years later, I've proven myself and now I am considered by many to be a Chicano artist, mm. which I'm proud of because I believe that that is the, the nation that I represent. I also represent Mexican Americans, Latinos, right? So I'm a lot like not all Chicanos would say that. Um, dismissive of my husband, dismissive of our marriage, dismissive of my knowledge of my of my contribution my work because i was doing what abstractions at this time what well, what was the subject that you were i was working on a series called microcosm macrocosm which were paintings that look like amoebas or they <laughs> look like solar systems monotypes they were just like they look like they could just be cellular structures or they could be you know photographs from the hubble it's very painful and very hard and in europe when i found this dance troupe i realized that there was this ancient culture that essentially belong to me. Hmm. And now they found so many pyramids in Mexico and Central America and South America that we are equal to Egypt. Easy. Tens of thousands of sites in the Americas. And I did a lot of travel and got to see a lot of those sites over and over again. How did that change your view of who you were and where you came from? There's a real spiritual pinning uh, in, in indigenous philosophy and thought the gods are not human beings and they don't look like human beings. The, you know, the gods are the winds. The god is God, one of the gods, main gods in all of the indigenous practices is water. You know, the beauty, the strength, the power, the ability of water. Are, are there emotions in there? Is there a way to align yourself with them? Uh, the best way to get to know water is to sit next to a, next to a river for a very long time. Uh, you'll hear the river's voice. You'll see the river's body. You'll see what the river does. The river will touch you in ways that stories about egotistical and vain gods that look like human beings can't. That's a very interesting point you brought up because it's really not a narrative about stories about people and what they do. It's about relationship to nature. All over the Americas, there's people who conduct ceremonies that are built and designed to help people have these experiences directly with nature. You know, probably uh, a sweat lodge in Los Angeles. When was that? 1980, 1979. How did you come to find yourself there? Well, the Flores de Aslan were invited to do presentations at colleges and universities. And uh, we went and did we, did, we were dancers. And my teacher, Josefina, would guide us in this Mayan choreographed dances with these beautiful gowns. And uh, we got invited to ceremonies to do presentations at ceremonies. And this is Native American stuff. This is, these are the religious uh ceremonies that were banned in the United States until what, 1960? You could go to jail. People got, you know, lynched for these things in the, in the early 20th century, late 19th century. It is such a different cosmology that I wasn't kidding when I said, do you have 10 hours to talk about things? Because it's a totally different way of working, of thinking, of experiencing the world, experiencing your place in the world, of finding your place in the world. It's a completely different way of doing it. Have you ever gone to the Hawaiian Islands? We've been out in the water, in the ocean, swimming in the ocean, and suddenly this feeling overcomes you of being out in the water and the sparkles on the water and the island and everything. Have you ever had that? Yeah, I went surfing, yeah. Yeah, when you're out there, you get it. Sometimes you get that, that moment where nature is, you're one with nature. You know, people talk like this. Uh, where the, uh, there's there's a connection between you and the animals below you and the waves below you and the mountains above you. There's just something that happens that clicks. A lot of times when I talk to people, I have to say, Indians don't have a Bible. There is no Jesus. It's a completely different cosmology. It's a completely different way of uh, communicating with the universe and connecting with the universe. It's more, if you will, it's more creative because you get to have your own experience. Your experience of the water when you're out there surfing is your experience of it. No one can take it away from you. No one can design it. No one can tell you what that is because it's with nature. 
you're supposed to experience this. You have to come here and do this. And then you, ex- there's too many rules and regulations. In the Native American experience, people get to speak at part of ceremony. You could go to a ceremony. I could invite you to a ceremony and you would have a time when you get to speak. How often do you get to do that? What was your sweat lodge experience like? Do you remember your first one? It's dark. It's uh, very humid, extremely humid. Is there a light from the coals? There's no coals. There's no fire inside the lodge. This is what people get always wrong. Fire's outside the lodge. Inside the lodge is uh, lava rocks from the fire that are hot. They come into the lodge and you pour water on them. So it's humid inside. It's actually like a giant sauna. People think there's fire inside. They're not, they're going to choke to death, but the fire's outside the lodge. So you have vapors that you get to breathe deeply. The vapors clean your skin. You get to see the herbs are placed on the rocks, which burn. So you get to see like little sparkles that are said to be like the planets and the stars. There's a deep emotional communication and visceral understanding of nature that can't be described unless you're there. And you get to speak and say your piece, sing songs. What did you say? Any number of things. Mostly what you're supposed to do is give thanks. You're supposed to say thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my work. It's really a religion of gratitude. It's a very, very beautiful thing. It's one of the most, I'm, uh, I'm truly grateful for having found it and for what, uh, taking the gauntlet through the rest of my life to find it. I ended up uh, conducting sweat lodge in the prison systems for 15 years. Wow. After that experience? Yeah. After your first uh, sweat lodge? Oh, no. After dedicating myself for, what, 20 years to it and going all over the nation and being involved with all kinds of ceremonies, I was invited by leadership. Was there like a, like a, a, like a, time where you felt most connected during those experiences? Like, do you, is there like a one that stands out in your mind? Well, yeah. There's a big ceremony and I took my children for many years with my children and my, my boys are 37 and 39 and they are, they are real men. They're truly good guys. They're really wonderful human beings. And they got to experience it, you know, you know, those kinds of experiences that men used to get in the, you know, the 13th and 14th century in indigenous worlds that nobody gets anymore. And it's too complicated to actually t- share details, but, you know, coming of age for a 20th century American male is like, what in the hell? Where do you have to go to get that? Oh, it's great stuff. And then in 2000, I said, okay, are you going to do ceremony or are you going to do art? Well, it was 20 years ago. And what the Indians say is I prayed on it for a whole year. For a whole year, I asked myself the same question. And I decided that I was given this gift to make art, it was mine, and that I needed to go back into it to be able to integrate my statement, to to integrate my personal statement on my whole life. And that's exactly what I've done. And that's what I mean. I went into it and then I floated out and I float back into it. So in 2000, that was like the the year of like refocusing on art and your like Mexican-American identity? Not so much my Mexican-American identity, because I was really more of an indigenous American by, you know, Chicanos really weren't interested in becoming Indians when I went into Chicanismo in the late 70s. They really weren't interested. Now they really are. Now they're interested in finding, you know, their indigenous past. I did that 30 years ago. And now I'm more of, I've come back to the philosopher poet where I'm trying to integrate those experiences plus the things we were talking about in terms of Europe and, and uh, my experiences in, uh, uh, you know, racially prejudiced America, America, but, you know, I'm a business owner. I have to gather it all together and make this final statement somehow or another. And recently in the last 12 years, uh, I found uh, Make Em All Mexican where I bought pricey antiques and paint the skin brown and just turned history and you know, the movie industry and politics up on its ear by making everybody brown. And I am I just finished that whole portfolio of work from Make Em All Mexican to the Brown Dot Project, where I plotted data on architectural grid paper using brown dots to signify specific pieces of data. And I think I've made at least 500 pieces in this giant portfolio of brown work, a culminating now in Brown Baroque where I'm actually creating installations of interiors that are all made in a milk chocolate brown with data oriented works everywhere and all kinds of make them all Mexican stuff. And so it took 
30 years of my life to experience my Latin American self, my Chicano self, my indigenous self. And then I finally came up with this image, which exemplifies that study. When did you first realize that? When did it start to like gain traction? Immediately. I no sooner started making them and people go, ah, this is great. Linda, where'd you get this idea? This is fab. This is a great idea. I've had several, I think I've had eight solo exhibitions of Make Them All Mexican and around the nation. I just told somebody, I said, it took 30 years for me to consolidate my experiences as a brown person. It t- and it's taken 12 years to produce the work. So now what? I'm presenting this work because I have it, but I'm already off into another portfolio. What I told somebody recently is I said, I had to make this brown stuff. I couldn't have experienced uh, the, the culture of Mexicanismo, the culture, the Chicano culture, the indigenous culture, my travels through Mexico, my danza, the ceremonia, all of that, and dedicated so much of my life to it and not come up with an image, but I wasn't going to make anything that wasn't decidedly mine. And that's the reason why I became a painter, right? What do you hope people come away from, like after looking at your work and after looking at the Make Them All Mexican? I just hope they ask a lot of questions, you know, because it really is about the work centers on the politics of color, class, and privilege. Do we really have to cause each other so much pain based on skin color and religious belief? And whether you come from a poor working class family, do we really have to make each other suffer so bad? I mean, what's the purpose of that? Um, I just hope people just ask themselves a lot of questions. You mentioned like this disconnect between Christianity and the Mesoamerican gods. And I think what is difficult about like some of the like Christianity's monotheistic religions is there are parables to help humans understand these things like connection to nature and stuff that are taken so literally. And really they were built to create these like these, these, these ways for simple people to understand. Yeah. That's what parables are for, so that everybody can understand them. And there are parables and stories to be told as well, and a series of ceremonies. It's very difficult to compare the two. Mm, Why? Uh, I'll tell you a a little story that I learned a long time ago. Uh, If you needed um, feathers from an eagle to be able to make a headdress uh, for uh, an indication of leadership or ceremonial uh, purposes, you would uh, capture the eagle without harming it. Then you would bring it to your house and you would tether the eagle to your roof for a year. And you would feed the eagle and you would name the eagle and you would make a real friend out of this eagle on your roof. And then at the end of the year, you would sacrifice the eagle and use the feathers. So that your experience of taking was mixed with real loss of a close friend. I mean, that's really a parable that is, would not be seen in the literature, in Christian literature, right? That a parable to teach somebody about the value of an animal's life and how the animal becomes a friend of yours and how you would protect it and then how you would, in order to be able to fulfill your, your, your role in ceremony, you would then have to find, have to sacrifice that friend. I think that's kind of like the issue I think with Christianity is it's, I think it's those same tenets, but not applied universally. It's like, just like, it's like hyper fixated on one group of people, one, one kind of consciousness. It's like the classic human thing to do. Or it's like, oh no, earth is the center of the solar system. Yes, Earth, you know, we're the center of all things that matter. Well, I think that what's happened today is that, you know, we've kind of taken a little dive into, and we've found a common point through all of it that could lead an individual who wants to have an artistic life uh, to be able to understand what it means to conceptualize a piece of art. What does it mean to come up with the idea for a play? What does it mean to come up with the idea for a screenplay or for a painting or for a song or for a dance? How do you do that? Where do you find the pieces that you pull together to make a statement about the relationship between things or, uh, 
the the uh, the exclusion of something or the inclusion of something else. And what are what are you talking about when you're talking about your work? And so today we've talked about many things that have influenced me as a painter and as a philosopher poet, where I try to create poetry and imagery based on philosophy, study, research, reading, listening, watching. And your own life experience too. Yes, experiencing. That hopefully someone can connect with. Hopefully they can maybe begin looking at themselves in the same way and kind of ask themselves, well, what do I believe? What is important to me? What do I enjoy looking at? What do I enjoy experiencing? Looking back at, at your life and everything you've learned from this path that you've taken, for the, you know, the, the, the person, whatever age that feels called to the life as an artist, what kind of advice do you give that person? Keep working at it. Don't stop. There's no failure. There's just experimentation, investigation, research. Like you said earlier, people forget about it. They forget about their creativity. It just sort of dissipates because they, they stop doing it because they have some unrealistic expectation of what it means to be an artist or what it means to be creative or to enjoy the hell out of it. It's hard work. There's no doubt about it. And sometimes it's frustrating, but anything, you know, they say anything really good is got to work for. Just don't stop. Don't let anybody make you stop. Don't let anybody cajole you or insult you into stopping. Don't listen to anybody who puts you down for your creative voice. Work with the best. Find a mentor that believes in you. Talk about art all the time. Be with people who want to talk about the creative process. Don't dumb down your game. Don't do it. You'll probably give up one of the most important elements of your personality in your whole life. You'll lose it and then you won't be able to get it back. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe rate the podcast five stars and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, DM us at Finding Founders Podcast on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. Finding Founders is produced and hosted by me, Samuel Don. Our audio editing team lead is Ashley Jimenez with support from Jessica Morales, Miley Lipton, Si Pan, Kenny Ray, Josie Yo, Matt Fernandez, and Merritt Hill. Our outreach and research team lead is Desiree Nunez, with support from Marissa Granados, Monica Lee, Sarah Tiersma, and Yao Wu. To see more of what we're up to, subscribe to our newsletter at findingfounders.co. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.